In my early teens, I was into rock and roll. Elvis was my favorite. During my first year in college, my roommate, Bruce, who was an excellent pianist, determined to open my eyes to classical music. I resisted, teasing him by arguing that music couldn't be that good because it activated only one sense modality. Bruce smiled patiently, making me promise to listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the fourth movement, ten times. And if, by then, it made no impact, he would not bother me again. On my sixth or seventh listening, like Paul struck down on the road to Damascus, I experienced a radical awakening. It was as if a small, dark window blew open, revealing a vast new world. Since then, I've always appreciated the preeminent power of music in exemplifying human-level experience. As I advanced in neuroscience in my education, and later as I began exploring the big questions of cosmos, consciousness, and meaning on Closer to Truth, I've often wondered, can music elucidate how the mind works? Can music probe human mentality? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Music and brain or mind have an explanatory relationship that is reciprocal. A traditional way of exploring the biology of music is to ask how the brain processes sounds, transforming mechanical changes in air pressure into astonishing mental experiences we call music. But what happens when we reverse explanatory direction and ask how astonishing mental experiences we call music can reveal the nature and workings of human mentality? I begin with a pioneering psychologist of music whose discoveries of sonic illusions transformed understanding of the auditory system. The author of Musical Illusions and Phantom Words, How Music and Speech Unlock Mysteries of the Brain, Diana Deutsch. We meet in Los Angeles at UCLA. Diana, can music be kind of a window or a probe to help us understand how the brain works? Certainly music can help us understand the brain. Let me give you an example. Hmm? So you'll be hearing two tones, one following the other, mm -hmm. and you have to decide, is, it, is this pattern going up in pitch or is it going down? Mm -hmm. And I have to say, before we try this, that there's no correct answer. Um, but anyway, we'll see what you hear, okay? So I would say that's going down. Oh, that's very interesting. I hear it going up. <laughs> really? Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay. Are there other people here that might like to say what they're hearing? <laughs> Good, because it really works very well. It yeah. works best in a group yeah. because you just, people just hear it completely differently from right. each other. Right. Now, let me play you another one. I would go up. I hear that go down. <laughs> what about other people? Down. Oh, you. <laughs> hey, th thanks for the ups. I was worried. Wow. <laughs> okay. So here's what's happening these tones are composed of a set of sine wave tones that are separated by octaves. And there are six such components. But because the rest of the harmonics that you usually get in complex tones are missing, there's no way to oh. determine how high or oh. how low the tone is. You can definitely hear the note name, the pitch class, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. But whether it's in one octave or another octave, there's really no answer to that question. Is that because it's in all of them? It it's because it's in all of them. And you hear a tone that's somewhere in the middle of the, uh, the group. Uh, uh. Now, the interesting thing is that the reason for these individual differences depends actually on the language to which the individual has been exposed, mostly in childhood. Uh. 
Mm. So, for example, the very mm. first one we heard, I grew up in London, and it was D, G sharp, and I hear G sharp higher than D. Okay, so I heard it go up. You heard it go down. Now, most people in California will tend to hear that pattern is going down. And that's true of other places in the US. So, for example, New York, I wouldn't want to make a guess because it would depend on whether it was the Bronx or Brooklyn, for example. <laughs> um, well, I was born in Brooklyn, grew up in New York, and then lived in California most of my life. So I'm a kind of a mixture of all of that. <laughs> right. But it might be Brooklyn then, because um, yeah, it's really what it. you heard mostly in early childhood that makes the difference, yeah, strangely enough. We did one experiment in which we had immigrants from Vietnam, it was after the Vietnam War, and we had two groups of subjects. Some of them were older and had come to the US in, a, uh, in adulthood, and another group had been born in Vietnam but come to the US in early childhood, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. both heard this is called the tritone paradox. Both groups heard the tritone paradox pretty much the same way as each other. Mm. On the other hand, English-speaking Californians, whose parents are also English-speaking Californians, heard it pretty much the opposite way. Mm. So it does seem to depend on the pitch range of speech that you heard in particular in childhood. So here again, music is showing something about the way we process sounds that are not, in fact, music, mm. but rather speech. And, and what does that imply about the nature of language and, and music? Well, it certainly shows that there's As a strong a relationship right, between right. language and music. This is one example where clearly the brain is processing both language and music, at least in part of the brain, mm -hmm. in, in a similar way. Uh, you've also done uh, important work on uh, absolute pitch. Yes. Well, I first discovered that people who spoke a tone language had a high prevalence of absolute pitch. When I was testing a group of people who'd come from Vietnam mm. and they happened to speak a tone language. So I did some experiments showing that people who speak a tone language do use absolute pitch to um, apprehend the meaning of words. But then the question arose, what about music? Because maybe it's just something to do with language. Mm -hmm. So I did another experiment, and this was in music conservatories in, in Beijing at the Central Conservatory of Music, who were one group. And there were another group of people at the Eastman School of Music that's in the US. And I gave both groups a test for absolute pitch. And these music conservatory students are obviously fine musicians in both cases, but there's a huge difference. So the, the prevalence of absolute pitch amongst these music students in the US was very low, whereas it was extremely high amongst the group mm. in, in Beijing. So when um, babies first learn to speak, you know, they have no difficulty. It's just like easy for them to learn. And the critical period lasts up to about age five, give or take a year and so on. Now, in the case of babies who are born into families that don't speak a tone language, they don't have the opportunity right. to assign pitches mm. to the meanings of words. Mm. Whereas pe babies who are born into um, families where tone language is spoken, it's natural for them to acquire yeah. at least the circuitry for absolute pitch yeah. at yeah. a very early age, at the same time as they're learning to yeah. speak yeah. other aspects of language. Very powerful. It certainly shows the plasticity of the brain in development. It does. It certainly does, yes. Diana's demonstrations are arresting. They may seem like clever parlor tricks, but they convey deep insights into how the brain works. What our minds hear is not always what our ears receive. Our brains are interveners, active interpreters, affecting our perceptions. One insight is a structural link between music and language. The strong connection between song and speech could reflect the evolution of language. For example, are there parallelisms between tones or notes in music and sounds or syllables in language? I discussed this with a psychologist of music, a pianist herself, the director of the Music Cognition Lab at Princeton, Elizabeth Margulis. One of the problems 
in language research or the big questions has always been how do people learn language, right? How do infants do this? Mm -hmm. It seems kind of like a prodigious ability that everybody mm -hmm. has. And I think one of the big contributions there has been the discovery of statistical learning. This idea that as we're listening to speech, uh, that we're really tracking the transition probabilities from sound to sound. And that's how, for example, that's a theory about how infants learn to segment the speech stream. Right, because if you're trying to learn a new language, one of your first problems is... Where are the words? Yeah. <laughs> and so if, if there's, you know, a, a word, right, once you start with the first syllable, there's the higher than normal probability that you'll transition to the next syllable mm -hmm. within that word, right? At the end of a word, though, you could go to any of a number of other words. So there's this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, statistical difference there that clever experiments have shown people are really sensitive to. But people can do that in music, too. So you can take sequences of tones, and even people who tell you they don't know anything about music show that they, you know, using reaction time tasks and various other kinds of methods, that they really are tracking these statistics uh, with, with some high degree of fidelity. And so that's how you build up enculturation over the course of a lifetime. It's a set of expectations that you bring to sounds that you don't even know. So you're saying the same type of mental cognitive processes that help you understand music in terms of the, the, the sound and the, 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 the breaking, the distances between them, it applies to language as well. It's exactly, but that it's used in interesting ways in music because now uh, when things happen that are surprising, this um, connects with the moments that seem most exciting and gripping and expressive in, in music. Music's powerful effect on emotions is one of the most interesting, motivating questions. And there are a number of theories out there um, about how this works. And I think I'll start with one uh, that looks at the way we experience speech and sound in non-musical contexts, right? So voices do certain things when they're sad, right, or mm -hmm. excited. And there are these sort of predictable changes that happen in the sounds that people make when they're mm -hmm. experiencing those emotions. Now you can do more things on an instrument than you could do with your voice. So this is kind of the super expressive voice theory that mm -hmm. music takes advantage of these characteristics and magnifies them. And this is partly responsible for this aggrandizement of emotion that can happen when you're listening to music. But it makes language the first, the, 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 pr the primitive, the primary one, and then music is an exemplification, because it could, could have been the other way around. Absolutely, and I mean, I think that there, it's that you know, uh, account is consistent with both theories, right? Because there's this idea that there was this proto-language before right. language that was more contour and prosody and music-like, right? right? But I, I, my intuition <laughs> is that uh, the part that's most revealing about how music and emotion work is really well chronicled by this Swedish psychologist, Alf Gabrielsson, who just asked hundreds of people to describe their absolute peak experience with music. And? So one of the things he found was this tendency for people to report a, a loss of the boundaries of themselves. So mm -hmm. that they were somehow becoming one with the music or, or moving out of their body and experiencing this kind of communion. Um, and w when I think about that, I, I don't think that that is just this one-off kind of thing that happens in these extremely special circumstances. It seems like a lot of everyday music listening is maybe not so extreme, but that there's some uh, similar process at work. Music wraps you up in, in what's happening that can be very powerful and pleasurable even if the music you're listening to is sad. Because mm. this is a fundamental <laughs> question, is why would we listen to sad, sad right. music? And in fact, often people will do that not to feel sadder, but to feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Music's role in various clinical and therapeutic contexts is one of the most um, interesting uh, future kinds of applications and territories to explore in this area. Uh, and part of why it has so much potential is simply that music draws so many different brain regions together. Mm -hmm. There's such tight 
interrelationships between, for example, the auditory system and the motor system, and between music and language. Uh, that mean uh, when you have damage in one area, for example, that uh, you can rely on music's ability to you know, interconnect areas to help rehabilitate um, lost function. Mm -hmm. How about some, some therapeutic situations, I mean, to alleviate pain or, or even to create a, uh, a kind of, a, people say even the immune system can, can react to it. One example is melodic intonation therapy that has been used to help people regain spoken ability when, uh, when they've lost it. When they've had a stroke or something? Yes, when there's been some kind of uh, damage that uh, prevents them from speaking, right? That um, you can start out getting them to sing, getting them to sing the words, and then you piggyback on that ability to sing mm. and gradually uh, come back using a part of the brain that hasn't been damaged uh -huh. to get back into the abilities right. from the but part that's been damaged. That you... The deep structural relationship between music and language helps explicate each. For example, parallel brain mechanisms using probability-based predictions for appreciating the sequence of tones in music and for learning the sequence of syllables in language. Another is that music and language each affect large areas of the brain well beyond their primary regions. Could this widespread impact of music throughout the brain, including regions related to emotion, explain the efficacy of music in clinical therapies? I go to Boston to speak with a past president of the World Federation of Music Therapy, Suzanne Hanzer. Well, we can start in the NICU the neonatal intensive care unit, where music therapists are finding that there are so many uh, procedures being done to these neonates, these newborns. They are subject to tubes and probes and heel sticks. And these stressors can affect these children throughout their lives. And so music therapists teaching parents how to use their voices to connect with the mm. baby mm. and finding sounds that are soothing, grabbing the attention, finding familiar sounds like a mother's voice. There are various interventions that have been effective mm. in actually um, getting the baby's heart rate stabilized. Mm -hmm. right. The mother's voice and simple melodies that are uh, in the range of a mother's voice, a female voice, oh, mm -hmm. uh, seem to be most mm. effective. Mm. But we know that there's a responsiveness to music with children who are autistic, with children who are profoundly delayed developmentally. And so that natural responsiveness to rhythm, to simple melody, to childlike activities, that engage a child in creating music, offer them a success-oriented environment mm. for them to thrive. The work that you've done in music therapy, particularly with older adults who have different levels of dementia, mm. um, is a very important probe. Recent studies in neuroscience have revealed that the parts of the brain where musical memory resides is quite independent of those areas that are atrophying, that are experiencing neural death with a disease like Alzheimer's. And so those parts of the brain are quite active and the musical ability is preserved. So there are so many cases of individuals who are no longer able to talk and express themselves, but they hear a song that they know and it might be from their youth, it might be from a very important milestone, and that music comes back immediately. And suddenly the person is singing all the words to that song, when perhaps they really haven't spoken or communicated an idea directly in years. So we have some evidence now that informs us about why it is that music is so important and remains so intact, even when other parts of the person are deteriorating. Hmm. 
From lullabies for newborn babies, to rhythms for autistic children, to old songs for dementia-afflicted elders, music permeates barriers impermeable to other therapies, though research is mixed and music is not a panacea. The fact that music therapy works for such diverse conditions testifies to the widespread impact of music in the brain. This leads back to my original question, how can music probe human mentality? I go to Los Angeles to meet a cognitive neuroscientist who studies how motor systems present our outer perceptions to our inner awareness, John Iverson. John, can we use music as a probe, as it were, to understand our mentality? Absolutely. Sometimes people view music as this optional, frilly thing that's just about emotions and so on, but no, you're absolutely right. Music can be a powerful window into the brain because it touches on so many different functions. I mean, the obvious ones, you mentioned emotion. Um, we've got perception, perception of pattern. We've got movement, you know, the fine motor skill needed to create, create music or to dance. So really, if you think about any, any basic me mental function, music touches on it. So there's a growing, quickly growing field of neuroscientists and psychologists using music uh, and its various qualities to help us understand how the brain works. Um, one area is really using music actually as a foil for language. Music and language share many structural features in terms of having hierarchical senses and rules and so forth, but music's a little easier to understand. The, the elements are, are simpler than language, so people are using music as a window into just linguistic processing, for mm -hmm. example, syntactic processing. In my case, we're using the fact that music has timing to start to understand how the brain understands time in general. And the idea that we're being led to is that the way the brain understands time is not just through listening, not just through the auditory system, but it's through interactions between the auditory and motor systems. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when we listen to rhythm, um, the motor system makes a critical contribution to how we actually understand that rhythm. There's a lot of interest now in looking at the impact of music on brain development. Um, just ask, you know, can music be used in a sense as uh, an enrichment um, to help the brain grow in, mm -hmm. a, in the same way that maybe, you know, certain kinds of food might enrich the way the body grows. We don't have growth curves for the brain in the same way that we do for height and weight. So the question is, well, does music influence those growth curves? How do you probe that? Typically, the way to answer these questions about nature, nurture, both, is to look longitudinally. So if you could look at a child's brain before they start doing music, while they're doing music and afterwards. Mm -hmm. And you can see, well, does that trajectory of the brain growth change? Does it steepen? Does it mature faster? Um, and there's been work suggesting from you know, various small aspects that, yeah, if you look at you know, brain responses in a, in a kid doing music, they look more mature uh, than a kid who wasn't doing well, music. Well, I, I think any sort of activity will improve brain development. The question is, does music even supersede that? Yeah, and this is, you know, a little dangerous territory. So there was a whole idea um, that listening to a certain composer's music might enhance the brain more than another composer's <laughs> music, okay? Um, we think, actually, it's just listening to music in general. Right. It, it arouses the brain. Right. Um, we definitely know that enriched activity, um, whether it be sports or music, can change the brain. Right, right. So, but the question is, well, what specific activities might help what specific brains? So we're talking about a whole right. deeper level of specificity, looking at, you know, does brain area A grow faster in a kid doing music, whereas brain area B might be growing right. faster in a kid doing basketball? To discern human mentality, music offers a special probe. What can the cognitive science and neuroscience of music reveal about what makes us human? Sonic illusions disabuse us of the false security that sounds we perceive in our heads are actually and always real sounds existing in the world. The link between music and language is profound, each informing the other, especially affecting timing and emotion though there was no certainty which came first, music or language, if either did. 
that music is therapeutic for diverse conditions, such as for adults with depression or dementia and for children with mental challenges, confirms music's pervasive impact throughout the brain. Music enhances brain development, no question. But does music do more than other kinds of rich environments and how to balance nature and nurture? Birds sing songs and animals vocalize sounds. My intuition wants human music to be on a higher plane. But I must challenge my intuition, striving to get closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.